Hey guys, Razorblade Mango here. And for today's video, this is going to be something a little bit different. This isn't the first time, obviously, this isn't the first time I've ever reacted to a trailer or a video or something like that. But this is going to be a reaction to a video from somebody I have actually had a conversation with before. And someone I actually, not know personally, but somebody I have spoken with before and had featured on the channel before. So this is going to be something a little bit different. And the reason that I'm doing this video, if the title wasn't obvious enough, is that Mr. Eli Farmer has decided to come to, to my turf. I, I see you, Eli. You're on my turf now as far as Kingdom Hearts. Uh, if you don't know who Eli Farmer is, he is the he, he is a voice actor. He is the person who started the Revive Radiata movement on Change.org. And all around, just cool dude. And he actually, I think like literally less than a minute after I saw this video in my f subscription feed, he DM'd me a link to it on Twitter and thought it would be something I'd be interested in. And uh, when I saw that, I thought about, you know, like, hmm, what would be interesting if I actually reacted to this? Because I, I am genuinely curious what proposals Mr. Farmer would make well, will make in regards to remaking the original Kingdom Hearts 1. I don't know if this is just Kingdom Hearts 1 or if he's going to keep making videos after this. The one that I'm really interested in seeing if he doesn't address in this video would be Kingdom Hearts 2 because that's my favorite game ever made. And so without further ado, I'm just going to jump right into this. And I'm going to be pausing the video from time to time because there's probably going to be some stuff that I want to talk about. So I don't know how long this is going to be. This is just something totally different from me, and but I really want to do it. So let's dive right in. I went back and forth for a while about even doing this video. One, because of the amount of time it was going to take. And two, I wanted to make sure that I could really do the series justice. Good, good. I'm someone who's enjoyed the Kingdom Hearts franchise since the very beginning. I was in elementary school when the first game came out, so I'm definitely someone who's grown up with the series. The whole inspiration for making this video really just came from me scrolling through YouTube. I saw a video titled, Why Kingdom Hearts Deserves a Remake, and I thought, that'd be pretty cool, but how would they change the story? And then that evolved into, hey, if I was sitting in the writer's chair, how would I change the story? And here we are. I want to emphasize the point that this is how I would write a Kingdom Hearts remake. I'm in no way insinuating that the series of events that I'm going to lay out should replace the original game. This isn't a how I would fix Kingdom Hearts video. Think of it more through the lens of Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy VII Remake. One isn't inherently better than the other, they're just different takes on the same story. I'm also really just going to hone in on the Kingdom Hearts elements. While the Disney characters and the worlds influence the narrative, they're not really what the story is about. The story is really about Sora and his friends, the various Keyblade wielders, and the struggles that they go through. Additionally, I'm not setting out to change things just for the sake of change. If there's a scene that works great as is, I'm not going to shoehorn something in there just so I can say I made it different. But with that being said, there may be a few pretty dramatic character changes or overall edits. Again, I'm not doing any of this frivolously. It's all to better serve the narrative that I plan to lay out for you. So without further ado, here's how I would write a Kingdom Hearts remake. Okay, I'm going to stop it right there. So, uh, I guess w the, the thing that interests me right off the bat with this is that uh, the comparison that Eli makes to his version of Kingdom Hearts being something similar to what Final Fantasy VII Remake is to Final Fantasy, which I, I, I understand where he's coming from in that regard. Um, I'm not sure I'd make that comparison just simply because Remake, well, Seven Remake is like a is almost like a, 
a weirdo spiritual sequel to it's like an alternate timeline final fantasy 7 that actually acknowledges the events of the original final fantasy which that could actually work in a kingdom hearts remake if they actually wanted to take it that far with kingdom hearts i feel like that's something they could get away with because the series is very very at least nowadays it's very very focused on um alternate histories and and past selves and timeline warping and dreams within dreams and stuff like that like i think kingdom hearts could get away with something like that and i you know you guys know my thoughts on final fantasy 7 remake where i thought the finale to that game was was genius and I, i could see it working with kingdom hearts as well and What's interesting too is that I don't think we really touched on this when we we did our when I interviewed him for the channel. Um, I don't I I don't think we've ever actually exchanged our history of Kingdom Hearts with one another. I know we've exchanged our histories with Radiata stories, which obviously we have. But as far as Kingdom Hearts, it, it's I did, I never knew that he actually uh, grew up with it and was there day one, like in elementary school from the first series, the first game. Because that was not my experience with Kingdom Hearts. My experience with Kingdom Hearts is I kind of was like meh about the series until 2. And 2 was my big in. So, and as far as Kingdom Hearts 1, I, I really like Kingdom Hearts 1. I think it's, I, I go back on back and forth on whether I think it's great or not. But I think out of all the Kingdom Hearts games, I think only next to 2 does it have the, the strongest story of the bunch. Because it's a lot more simplified compared to the the ones that were to come later and that's not always a good thing you know simple doesn't automatically mean better but in the case of kingdom hearts i think its simplicity is refreshing in comparison to the absolutely like entanglement of plot threads that come later in the series so uh yeah so let's continue with the the video but oh oh, i want to say that uh i'm not sure I agree that the story needs changing. I actually would be more in the camp of let's fix Kingdom Hearts 1 because I think the remaster did some good things like some obvious quality of life features like skippable cutscenes and the ability to control the camera with the right analog stick instead of the R- 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 L- L2, R2. I don't remember. if the, I think that's how you controlled it with the PS2, but it was just terrible back then. But... Uh, there are still some things I think could be fixed with the original Kingdom Hearts, but I- I'm I will before I make comments on that. I want to see what Mr. Farmer has to say about that. I want to take a moment to explain some of the changes I've made to the lore and the terminology oh, in the this alternate lore. Kingdom Hearts okay. timeline, starting with light and darkness. These are both forms of energy, and every living creature is comprised of some quantity of one or both of them. When harnessed, light is primarily used to heal, create, and purify, while darkness is used for destruction and alteration. A good illustration of this is the types of magic they produce. Light is used for spells like cure and holy, while darkness is used for spells like fire, blizzard, and thunder much like white and black magic from the core Final Fantasy series. Next is hearts. Hearts are essentially souls. They're a person's essence. They're- that's, a, it's a really, that's a really smart move to use um, Kyrie's third, third theme as the, the theme for the heart. I just want to say that. I think that's a, ni- a good, really good decision on his part. They're also where light and darkness are stored inside the individual. The balance of that light and darkness changes with each person, so someone like Sora might be 70% light and 30% dark, whereas Riku might be 30% light and 70% dark, and Kairi is 100% light. Hearts can vary greatly in their carrying capacity. This is why we see some individuals able to hold a tremendous amount of light or darkness inside of them, while others are much more ordinary. This scale, or metric, is referred to as heart capacity. And just like in the original story, under the right conditions, one body can hold multiple hearts. Now, we're going to talk about the Heartless. Despite the name, Heartless have hearts. A Heartless is created when a heart becomes 100% darkness. And the higher the heart's capacity, the more powerful the Heartless. 
this is why most Heartless are small and relatively weak, as most people can't hold much darkness inside of them before they transform. Again, someone only turns into a Heartless if their heart is filled with 100% darkness. This is why characters like Maleficent don't turn into a Heartless. Her heart might be 99.9% .9 darkness, but as long as there's still some light left, she won't turn. Lastly, a Heartless can be turned back into the original person. However, this is an ability exclusive to the Princesses of Heart, and for the large majority of the story, they'll be completely unaware that they have this ability. Speaking of the Princesses of Heart, just like in the original story, there are seven of them, and their hearts are 100% light. This is exceedingly rare, as every other person has some quantity of darkness inside of them. And if all seven princesses are brought together, they have the ability to open a pathway to Kingdom Hearts, so not much changing there. Ah, Kingdom Hearts. Kingdom Hearts is a place, but not one you can travel to with traditional means. It's a pocket dimension, one where all hearts come from and all hearts return. It's also a place that's overflowing with both light and darkness. So theoretically, if someone could harness all of the energy there, they could create and destroy on a planetary or even a solar system level. This is why numerous characters throughout the story seek to control Kingdom Hearts, and one of those individuals is Ansem. In this version of the story, Ansem isn't a Heartless, he's a nobody. So, oh, okay. let me give you the new definition of nobodies. Okay. First off, nobodies are incredibly rare. Almost as rare as, say, the princesses of heart. When someone has an exceedingly strong will, mm. a very high heart capacity, and their heart becomes 100% darkness, a nobody is created. To emphasize how rare they are, there won't be any grunt or low-level nobodies. The nobody enemy types from the original game will instead be receiving a darker palette swap and reclassified as Heartless. Outside of Ansem, there will only be a dozen or so nobodies. Nobodies are insanely powerful, and they can handle even the strongest Heartless with relative ease. Additionally, nobodies retain their original form, as well as their mental capacity. This helps differentiate them from the more primal- Okay, but before I, before I forget, so... I find that interesting that uh, he's proposing to basically make nobodies an extremely rare breed and only have them appear when they come from somebody of exceptionally strong will, which that that's something that's always confused me about the lore of Kingdom Hearts is that there are so many nobodies. There, there are as many nobodies as there are heartless in the world of Kingdom Hearts, it seems. So, it makes sense for there to be little grunts of Heartless, but for people, there there has to be a lot of people that have exceptionally strong wills, then, if there is a nobody that is left behind, or, sorry, yeah, nobody that is left behind. Which, that was something, like I said, that always confused me about the original. And I, I get it, they had to use, or not the original, sorry, about two, is that I always understand, I, I, I understand that they had to bring in a different enemy class. I understand that they had to justify it in order to have that enemy class be around. You know, they have to they have to have things like the the unversed be around, like the the nightmares from DDD be around. I get it. You need to change up enemy types every so often. But with the nobodies, there's always that strange little thing of how are there so many people with exceptionally strong wills given that all of these these organization members are able to just snap their fingers and summon a, a crap load of of nobodies like nothing so what eli is proposing is something i'm not i'm not against um i just think as far as the first one i don't think it's really necessary because uh, unless unless he's going to go further which it's possible considering he's making this part 1 and again i don't know if this is going to be part 1 and then part two leads into also talking about the first Kingdom Hearts, or if this is, he's going to continue this with each one, like part two will focus on Chain of Memories, part three will focus on Kingdom Hearts 2. I don't know. So, but, but as far as the first one, I'm not sure that change is necessary if we're talking exclusively about OG Kingdom Hearts. So anyway, I'll continue. Heartless. Now, back to Ansem. 
In the original story, there was the confusion with Ansem Seeker of Darkness and Ansem the Wise. To alleviate that confusion, I'm going to be renaming Ansem the Wise. Luckily, he already comes with another name, Diz. so I'm just going to be calling him Diz. Yeah. Diz, or Darkness and Zero, isn't his real name, it's more so a title that everyone refers to him by. Like, the one above all, from the Marvel Universe, or Father, from Fallout 4. So when Sora meets with Leon and his friends, instead of them telling him about Ansem, they'll be telling him about Diz. To further add to the mystery of Diz, no one will actually know what his real name is. The last thing I want to touch on is the various Disney worlds. If I don't mention a specific change, you can pretty much assume that the worlds play out the same way they do in the original story. So, outside of what's on this- Hopefully he makes some changes to Deep Jungle and Atlantica, cause uh... Yeah, we need some changes on those, uh, Mr. Mr. Farmer. This list, things operate pretty much the same way they do in the original Kingdom Hearts. And now, we can get started. The opening hours of the game are going to stay pretty much the same. Alright, good. As it stands right now, I think the story does a really great job of introducing the characters as yeah. well as setting up the adventure. 100% agree. My first change doesn't come until after Sora completes the first four worlds. In the original, there's a scene where we see the Disney villains gather around a table in Hollow Bastion. The thing that I'm going to change here is I'm going to insert Ansem. After the meeting concludes, mm. I want there to be a scene where Maleficent and Ansem talk privately. I think this will better help establish their roles, where Maleficent is the figurehead and Ansem's really the one pulling the strings. Next, we're gonna go to the um, scene. I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that because one of the things I like about the original Kingdom Hearts is that Ansem is like the 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 man behind the curtain, and there there it's a very basic JRPG trope where the villain that you thought you were going to fight during the game turns out to just be the lackey or there is somebody exceptionally more powerful out there. For example, in Dragon Quest VIII, you think you're going to be fighting Duel Magus the whole game. But once you beat him and literally like the halfway point, uh, it's swapped out and you realize that Duel Magus isn't the real villain. It's just like this giant purple fat demon guy and it's it's not it's it's the destroyer of worlds it's the god of death it's not dual magus and i always liked that about kingdom hearts is in that ansem is like the the figure that's really pulling the strings but he's not there most of the time and he's in the background and he just allows Malefic maleficent to think that she's in control which makes it all the more intriguing when he comes in and just zaps a bunch of darkness into her to where she becomes so overpowered to the point where darkness consumes her in the end. And even if somebody has like 100% darkness, I think it is possible for them to become fully corrupted and still be wiped out. Like I'm not I'm not sure I'd argue that Maleficent is 99.9% .9 darkness and like 0.1% light. I think it makes more sense that she's 100% darkness, but she is one of the people that has the ability to control the Heartless, or at least she thinks she does. And Ansem is just the guy behind the curtain kind of allowing her to do it for the time being until he's like, all right, you've used up my usefulness for you. Boom. Now you're you know, you're like bers berserk Maleficent by my hand. So we'll continue. Where Riku and Sora reunite for the first time in Traverse Town. Here, we'll have Riku challenge Sora <laughs> to a friendly sparring match. I really want to establish Riku as Sora's rival. I like that so idea. So kind of like in the Pokemon games, where your rival will challenge you at various points in the story, I want there to be more moments like that with Sora and Riku, where they're constantly kind of gauging each other's power. And once the fight's over, Riku and Sora will still go their separate ways. Again, leaving the events of the Disney worlds mostly intact, I'm gonna pick back up after Agrabah. Here, there's a scene where Hades and Maleficent are talking to Riku about capturing Jasmine. After this conversation finishes, I want there to be a scene where Ansem pulls Riku aside. I want to use this moment to establish that Ansem and Riku already have some level of familiarity, but also to show that Ansem is the one who's teaching Riku how to use the powers of darkness. 
In the original story, we see Riku's abilities progress over the game, but we're never really shown him training or practicing. This also helps to develop the mentor-mentee relationship between Riku and Ansem. That's gonna play a role in the story later down the line. The next place I want. Um. Okay. So again, I'm I don't necessarily agree with that change because I I like in the original Kingdom Hearts how Ansem strikes right at the moment where Riku is at his most vulnerable and his self esteem is basically at like the pits after getting his ass handed to him by Sora in Hollow Bastion. And he realizes that that's that that he that's not enough. Like his strength is not enough. And he's like, why? I, I did everything. I, I, I brought everybody. I'm I'm the favored one. I'm the one that was supposed to have the keyblade. And then that's when Ansem, Ansem strikes. I'm not sure. And Eli is going to establish it later. I, I get that. And I, I might change my opinion when I hear his thoughts on it later on. But. I'm not sure I agree with that decision, only because, again, I like to see Ansem more in the background. He's not like Xemnas, where Xemnas is somebody that is very clearly the leader of an organization. Ansem is just some guy. He's just some really powerful figure who likes to be in the background and see how things play out before deciding to intervene. So, again, that's my thing go is Monstro. <laughs> I'm going to keep the whole segment about Riku capturing Pinocchio. Okay. Only this time, before Riku runs off with him, he's going to challenge Sora to another duel. Okay. Regardless of how the fight goes from, say, a gameplay standpoint, Riku will still run off with Pinocchio and tease Sora about the difference in their abilities. Well, then well I... Uh... See, I I am um, I never really I'm not really a, a big fan of these these sections of the game that will play out the same no matter what happens. Like if if Riku wins, I'd like there to be some kind of difference. Maybe if Sora maybe make it a much harder fight than the other ones than than the Heartless that comes at the end of Monstro. And if Sora is good enough to where he manages to beat Riku in that moment, the level ends early, and you're, you're able to rescue Pinocchio a little earlier. Rather than, doesn't matter if you win or lose. Like, if it, do, if it doesn't matter if he wins or loses, then I feel like it's just kind of a waste of the player's time. Um, and I think, I think they could use that trick maybe once. If you're gonna, if you're gonna use that trick, use it at the very beginning. And because when, you, when you're fighting in Traverse Town, it doesn't really matter at that point because there's no real stakes yet. Um, if Riku wins, great. He runs off and he's like, ha, I'm still bet. Looks like I'm still better than you. Then if he loses, then he can be like, oh, crap. Sora's more powerful than I expected. I better amp up my game. And I think that's maybe the only time they should have this kind of friendly rivalry between the two because he makes the comparison to Pokemon. And I'm not really a big fan of it in, in Pokemon either, at least not in the the like newer stuff. I, I just because if they do it like how it was back in the day with Ash and Gary, where you absolutely just hate each other and there's really no sympathy, I think that could work. But Riku is you're meant to kind of have this conflicting feeling about fighting him. And I think until he becomes possessed by Ansem, I don't think continuously fighting him over and over again throughout the game I don't think that really serves a purpose. Uh, just do it once, do it at Traverse Town, and I think that's fine. But anything beyond that, I would just wait until again he he fights um, when he's possessed by Ansem. And pick back up with the first encounter against the Parasite Cage. Instead of a battle, Riku will just one shot the Heartless using the Dark Fyraga technique that he's been practicing with Ansem. While Sora, mm -hmm. Donald, and Goofy look on in amazement. Riku will again comment on the difference in their abilities. This is all to further illustrate the widening gap between Riku and Sora. Sora will manage to track Riku down just like he does in the original story. I love the standoff that these two have here, so I'm going to be leaving that intact. Their conversation will be interrupted by a second, stronger parasite cage before Riku slips away into a dark portal. After Sora, Donald, and Goofy manage to escape Monstro, 
we'll pick back up with Riku meeting with Maleficent. In the original story, this is the point where Maleficent gives Riku the ability to control the Heartless. I'd like to add in a follow-up conversation with Ansem. Here, Ansem tells Riku that controlling the Heartless is useful, but that he should focus on increasing his own strength. This is important because it helps establish that there's different ways to use darkness. Some are more effective and some are more dangerous than others. This is something that was touched on in the original story, but not really emphasized to a great deal. After this, the story remains most of the same, until Neverland. Just like in the original story, Sora will get captured and he'll have to fight his way through the ship. When Sora manages to corner Riku, Riku will summon a Heartless to fight Sora. However, instead of immediately retreating, Riku will stick around to see how the fight plays out. After Sora wins, Riku retreats with Kairi's body, and he leaves Captain Hook behind to deal with Sora. Sora and his friends defeat Captain Hook, and then Tinkerbell leads them to the clock tower. But when they arrive, Riku is waiting for them. Riku tells Sora that the last Heartless he summoned was weak, but this one won't go down so easy. And then we have Riku summoning the Clock Tower Phantom. Ooh. At first, Riku is really boastful, but soon realizes that he has no control over the Heartless. The lack of control scares Riku and causes him to flee. And because of this event, Riku decides that he's never going to summon another Heartless. In the original story, Riku only ever summons Heartless while he's on Neverland, but then never does it again. It's never explained why. So, this scene helps to fill in the gap. Sora and his friends manage to defeat the Clock Tower Phantom, and then we pick back up with Riku talking to Maleficent. Riku- Ooh, I, re I really like that change. Okay, that, that's, a, that's a really good change. Um, that, doesn't, that doesn't conflict with my disagreement on having to fight Riku over and over again, but I like that it's Riku sticking around to watch Sora fight a Heartless in Neverland, and then he comes back. Because I've always felt like the, Phantom Cl the, the Clock Tower Phantom was a really, really cool boss that was given an unfortunately annoying... Uh, combat system to to work with like i really i'm not a fan of the the secret fight of the the fan of the clock tower phantom but in the context if they if they strip away the crap that you have to do with with the actual hands on the clock then i think that would be a really good change and i, I really like that like get rid of that guy as get rid of him as as as, as a secret boss i've never liked it um i like the rest of the secret bosses in kingdom hearts one just not that one. That one just annoys me. So I like that change. He tells Maleficent that he doesn't want to use the Heartless anymore, and he wants to get stronger on his own. Maleficent agrees to help, and brings out even more of Riku's power. Shortly after, mm -hmm. Ansem enters the room. He tells Riku that even though he has more power, it won't do him any good unless he learns how to focus it. And then we can have this really epic scene where Ansem teaches Riku how to enter his iconic dark mode. This is one of Riku's most distinctive looks, and yet, in the original story, the transformation sequence is less than a second. Well, because it's, it's so not... I well. felt like it was necessary to spend more time with it, uh, just to emphasize how important the transformation is to Riku's character. I'm imagining something almost Dragon Ball-esque, uh, like when Gohan transforms into Super Saiyan 2 for the first time. We then catch back up with Sora and his friends. Um, again, I'm not, I'm not necessarily against the idea of um, Riku having more of a hand of like his own development when it comes to his powers. What again? I'm not. I, I like more the idea that it's Ansem possessing Riku in that fight, where you where you fight him in the you know in the tower in Hollow Bastion. And I I agree that it's you know it's it's less than a second of its transformation, but I'm not sure it would really 
I, like imagining it turning into some kind of Dragon Ball esque transformation. It's it seems more over the top than it needs to be. I find it almost like weirdly creepy that Ansem has just such full control over Riku at this point that he's able to just simply morph into this like really powerful, you know, badass looking costume like nothing. I, I really like that. I find that more suitably creepy than kind of an over the top Dragon Ball S kind of thing. As they arrive in Hollow Bastion, I really enjoy the segment with the Beast and Sora yes. losing the Keyblade. Great, so great scene. I'm not going to be touching any of that Good. stuff. Yes, that's a great the scene. The one thing I am going to tweak, though, is Donald and Goofy. I always felt like it was so uncharacteristic of them to just leave Sora in that moment. So, in my yeah. version of events, I think that I'm going to have them stick with Sora. And this really actually doesn't change a whole lot because once they meet back up with Riku, you can still have Goofy come in for the save. Well, that's uh, that whole scene where they leave Sora. I, I think I think that works. I, I'm not sure I would change that either because I think Kingdom Hearts more than the original Kingdom Hearts more than any other ones in the series. It is a very stereotypical hero's journey, and that point where Sora is at his lowest that's that's the very bog standard plot point in a hero's journey story, and I think. I, I think I wouldn't get rid of that because that in turn makes Sora a lot more likable when he's able to bounce back after losing, you know, after Sora, or sorry, after Donald and Goofy abandon him and go with Riku and then he loses the Keyblade itself and he only has to fight with that crappy little <laughs> little stick sword and the beast is what kind of eggs him on to keep fighting and it makes it all the more satisfying when Donald and Goofy return to him and that's when Sora's like, I don't need the Keyblade these guys are my power. And I feel like that it's more effective after actually losing them at some point. And I, I think it's just, it's kind of strange to just have Sora, Don, and Goofy already arrive in the tower. It feels like the stakes are kind of just lessened and the reversal of fortune against Riku is, is more satisfying after you know, Don and Goofy abandoning him, basically. It's a little strange, I, I grant Eli, but I, I like it more in, in the long run. I wouldn't necessarily change that. And there's no way I could ever remove my friends or my power. It's one of the most iconic lines in the entire series. So this Probably whole the sequence, most iconic line. leaving it as is. After Sora manages to get the Keyblade back, Riku runs off and meets up with Ansem. Riku gets one last power boost. The only difference is, in my version of events, Ansem doesn't take over his body. Okay. Ansem doesn't need Riku's body <laughs> because he has his own. We'll touch more on that later. Okay. The story then carries on like the original, with Sora defeating Maleficent and meeting up with Riku for one last showdown. Of course, in this version of events, Riku isn't possessed. He's fighting Sora because he's bitter. He's insecure about losing to him and everything that's happened with Kairi. Sora manages to beat Riku again, even with the power boost. Then, Riku reverts back to his regular clothes and passes out on the ground. And just like in the original story, Sora uses Riku's Keyblade to release Kairi's heart. Kairi wakes up just in time to watch Sora fade away. Yep. But Good before stuff. she can process what's really going on, Ansem appears. We then get the face reveal. He takes off the robe and we see the Ansem that we're all familiar with. Ansem begins to approach Kairi, but just out of frame, we see Riku mustering enough strength to get up off of the ground. Riku then uses the little energy he has to open a dark portal. Before Ansem can react, Riku tackles him into the portal, sending both of them into the darkness. But it gives Kairi a chance to escape with Donald and Goofy. This sequence will have a deep impact on Kairi because in a matter of moments, she's watched both of her best friends sacrifice themselves right in front of her. After Kairi manages to escape, we have the whole sequence of events with Sora turning into a Heartless and then turning back from a Heartless. I'm not gonna be making changes to any of that because I think it works quite well as is. Yep. From here, the sequence of events will play out pretty much the same, Good. with Sora's second trip to Hollow Bastion 
and confronting Ansem at the end of the world. Although, his conversation with Ansem is gonna go pretty differently. This is where we'll learn a lot about Ansem, where he comes from, and what his real motives are. Ansem starts by apologizing to Sora for everything that's happened with Riku. What? He tells Sora uh. that he wanted to mentor Riku, oh. because Riku reminded him a lot of himself, and that he's actually disappointed that Riku's now lost in the realm of darkness. Ansem goes on to say that the only reason he worked with Maleficent was because he needed her help to reach Kingdom Hearts. When Sora asks why Ansem needs Kingdom Hearts, Ansem replies that it's the only way he can be free. Ansem hmm. is on the run. He tells Sora huh? that he's being pursued by an organization that's far more dangerous than he is. He's tired of running and believes the only way he can be safe mm. is to have control of Kingdom Hearts. Ansem acknowledges that Sora can't allow him to have his way and that their meeting has to end in conflict. And then their battle begins. Okay, Another so I, I get that... that... Um, and I think it can work in context in some situations where the villain is sympathetic. Um, spoilers for Persona 5 Royal. The, the final boss of the missable third semester is an extremely sympathetic, likable person. And the whole point of fighting him is, is, is really put questioning what the nature of stealing hearts does for certain people. And whether it can be a power used for good in Maruki's own specific way. Um, I'm not sure I really like this idea of, of Ansem being this sympathetic villain just because I really like Billy Zane's just sinister voice performance as Ansem. Like, I, I never have liked... I mean, I like Ansem as a villain, but... I've always thought he lost something ever since Billy Zane declined to keep voicing him in, in further entries. Um, because I think Billy Zane is a villain and this is just, it's just so much more like, Ooh, like so much more like, like I love it. It's so much more fun to have these villains that are just evil. And I think simplicity, it, it works better in this case where it's, I'm like that he's on the run from the organization is eh, I, I guess, but I mean, I don't know. I, I it just, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm sorry. Eli, I'm not a big fan of this particular change. Um, I'm going to, I'll get, I'll get, I'll give you my honest opinion. I'm not a fan of this particular change. Major difference between the original Ansem and this one is this Ansem doesn't fight using the guardian. He still fights <laughs> using the powers of darkness, but just in different ways. The final battle with Ansem will play out mostly the same, except for in his final form, I want to do something a little bit different. I would have changed the music too. I would have changed it to the, to the, uh, cause this is the, the Xemnas theme. So, eh, like uh, maybe we'd have used just the classic Ansem theme for this one. Different. The final fight. Instead music. of Ansem becoming that big, heartless spaceship thing. Oh, I like the heartless spaceship version, thing. He's going to use his powers to merge with the island itself. Kind of like Ooh, Oogie Boogie okay. when he turns into the giant tower, but even on a larger scale than that. This makes it so that Sora's home is now his final enemy. Just the gameplay possibilities and all the cool physics stuff that you could do with that, but that's not what this video is about. But cool side note. After Sora manages to defeat Ansem's final form, in a last ditch attempt, Ansem opens a giant portal and sucks everything down into the realm of darkness. Sora opens his eyes and sees Ansem reaching out for the door to Kingdom Hearts. And just like in the original story, as soon as the doors open, Ansem is showered with light and fades away. Kingdom Hearts is light! A heart leaves his body and flies through the doors. And just on the other side of the doors, we see that Ansem's heart has made its way to Riku, the only person he's ever made a connection with. We then get the ending scene of the game, with Sora and Riku working together to close the door to Kingdom Hearts. 
From there, the ending plays out just like the original. Sora and Riku close the door, Mickey makes his appearance, Destiny Islands comes back, and the journey continues. Ah, so we are going to do more games after this, So, probably. the door is closed, the day is saved, if you want to know how the story continues, yeah. you're going to have to come back for the next video. Ah. Uh, damn it, Eli! <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's funny. I like that. Um, hey, right, good, good, good video. Very, I, I like some of the ideas that that Eli proposes. I don't like some of them. Uh, it's it's a little bit of a mixed bag for me as far as overall the the ideas that he presents. And um, again, I it's a personal thing where if a villain is going to be sympathetic, I'd. I'd like them to kind of put in more of the groundwork to establish them as a sympathetic villain. Where I don't, I don't think Eli kind of presents enough of a of kind of like spreading the seeds or the breadcrumbs to the fact that he's this kind of semi sympathetic figure. I feel like it's kind of a little too sudden when it's revealed during the Hollow Bastion section, whereas in the original Kingdom Hearts, where Ansem, when Ansem meets Sora in on Destiny Islands, there's still this sinister vibe that is there, which you get you you know that this guy is going to play a bigger role later on, and it's more of a surprise when he shows up and it's like I'm the real villain in all of this, and the fact that he's very simplistically evil, I I I almost prefer that than this kind of kind of awkward middle ground, and I feel like it takes a lot of work to create a really dangerous yet sympathetic villain um i think persona 5 royal did it extremely well um i could uh, off the top of my head i can't think of any other examples but i i sure i could think of some if i if i sat down and actually put my brain to it but yeah overall a uh, good job eli i liked this very video a lot um who knows i might change my mind on some stuff once he elaborates a little further where the story will go and I assume he's going to talk about chain of memories next. So I will definitely be on the lookout for that. And yeah, that'll be it for me today. Um, make sure to go to Eli's original video, make sure to, you know, watch it, tell him what you thought about it in his, his video, leave a like, subscribe to his channel, subscribe to both his channel and his revive Radiata channel, which is really good. So yeah, I'll catch y'all later.